Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank this opportunity we may be in your home. Lord, an opportunity to come and, and to celebrate the liturgy and the Eucharist, Lord. And I ask that your presence, Lord, that it does not stay downstairs, Lord, that it comes upstairs with us here. For, Lord, I, I know that you've got words for us today, Lord. I know that there's a message that you want to share for us, Lord. And I ask that it be specialized for every single one of us here, Lord, that it might not be my words, Lord, but it's that your spirit, it's what's talking, Lord. I ask that you give me the, the, lift, the gift of prophecy that I may deliver your word to your people, Lord. And, Lord, I ask that you give us, your people, Lord, the, the ability to be good soil that the word that you give us, Lord, will take root and that will bear 30, 60, and 100 fold. Lord. And I ask that you hear these prayers lift in the session of our saints from our tears. Here's what we pray in one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, finds the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, guys, so I will tell you, I have missed being here, and I was trying to figure out exactly how many weeks I've been missing, and it feels, it feels like a very, very long time, and I think I counted four. No, actually, I take it back. It's been five. So uh, it feels really, really good to be back. Um, I've missed this group, but I'll be honest with you, I have not. Uh, we were having a great time without you guys. Uh, Noel can, can confirm with me, but uh, for a couple of weeks, actually about three of those weeks, we were in Kenya with Emba Boulis, uh, with the Coptic mission out over there, and we had like a phenomenal time. So do we miss you guys? Yes. Would we do it again in a second? So, uh, and we look forward to missing you guys a lot more with ever, you know, as many opportunities as, as we basically can. So I highly recommend, if you've never been to Africa, you should go. If you've got youth, you should send them, and we'll kind of wrap it up there. But if you guys remember, before I went on that trip, we, we, we had this series where I was just kind of, well, we, we did the whole series, um, about the parables, and then I kind of went rogue, so I just had a couple weeks before I was leaving, and I didn't want to start out a whole other series, and then I got back, and I didn't know what I want my next series to be over, so I decided that today I'm just going to go rogue as well, and I'm going to share one of my favorite stories in the entire Bible. Like, this is one of those stories that, like, I get really excited about, because it's such a game-changer story, um, and it's one of Christ's miracles, and how familiar are you guys with the story of the woman with the issue of blood? You guys know that? It's found in three out of four of the Gospels. Um, Luke 8 is where I kind of usually go to to kind of like read up on it again. And I'll, I'll just give you guys a high level just in case you're not that familiar with the story. But there's a story. Um, there's a guy, Jairus. His, uh, his, his daughter's sick. So there's a bunch of people around Christ. He goes, finds Christ and says, hey, my daughter's sick. You know, she's 12 years old, this and that. Can you, can you come lay your hands on her? So Christ says, yes, I will go. So he goes, and while he's on his way to go heal Jairus' daughter, who's been, you know, alive for 12 years, there's this woman who's been having this issue of blood for 12 years. And, and so she's currently bleeding, right? And she sees Christ kind of like in the multitude, and she pushes her way through the crowd, and she basically says, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, right? So she goes, she touches the hem of his garment, um, she's healed. The blood, it says, instantaneously just kind of dries up. Um, he says, and I think we all probably all know this part of the story, who touched me? And then his disciples, uh, it might have been St. Peter, I don't remember, basically says, you know, you're surrounded by people and everyone's like all over you and you're asking who touched you? And he says, no, power left. Like someone specific, to, like power left me, right? And then the lady basically says it was me, tells the story. He, like, you know, he heals her, restores her, all of that other stuff. So that's a, that's a very, very high-level thing. But I want to kind of set the stage for the story real quick, right? Because we know we have this woman. We know we have an issue of blood. We know that she's been bleeding for 12 years, right? And we'll all hear her situation, and we'll be like, that's tough. Like, that's, 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 that's a bad situation. Like, I don't think anybody, any woman would want to be bleeding for 12 years. But I think, um, so that was, that was a woman, and that was her issue, okay? And it was a major issue. And it was a major issue even at the deeper level of why, like, you know, why it was a major issue. And I think if we're honest, like, that might be her issue. Peter has his issues. Rudy has his issues. Noel has his issues. Like, we all have our issues. Okay? And I think that that's, like, a very, very important connection to the story that we have to realize. This isn't just a lady with an issue because we are all people with issues. Right? Well, the lady found a solution to her issue in this story, Right? But to understand her issue in Leviticus 15, 19, okay, it says, if a woman has a discharge and the discharge is from her body and it's blood, she shall be set apart for seven days. 
and whoever touches her shall be unclean until evening. And in the case this expense extends past her monthly cycle, it is to be followed by another seven days of being unclean. So when you look at like how the law looked at this woman, she was unclean. Not only was she unclean, but anyone who came across her and touched her was unclean. So if you understand, you know, it's talking about here, you know, if it, you know, seven days, right? It talks about if it extends past her, her monthly cycle, right? So you say her monthly cycle. So now we're talking, we're 12 years into it. So how long has she been unclean? Probably 11 years and 50 some weeks. So you can imagine her state. And so when you look at like what that means for the life of this woman, right? Personally, just thinking about it, it means that she was very lonely. Very lonely, right? She was very, even physically unclean to imagine being discharging for 12 years, right? And the third thing is very, very fake. Because how real could she really be with the people around her? Do you think that this was something that she was very open about? There's no way she could be open about it. Because if she was open about it, no one would ever come anywhere close to her. Because according to the law, not only was she unclean, but she would defile anybody who even touched her. Which means, you know, very, very fake life. Very, very shallow relationships, right? This aspect of her life was totally totally lived in the dark. And I want to tell you, and the thing that just gets me about the story, right, is like when we have aspects of our life that are in the dark, there's a lot of voices in our head that speaks to us. Right? So you can imagine what the voices in this lady's head were, were telling her. Nobody, nobody wants you. You're not lovable. You're not worth anything. You're unclean. You're detestable. Right? All of these voices, right, just lying to her in her head. And I think after 12 years from now, I think the only thing that she had developed is a very, very good ability to hide her condition. Just, a, like, just to prevent being condemned to a life of solitude. Because as much as it stinks to, to be completely alone and not have any deep relationships, at least there are people around you. Because really her fate and the only thing that I could even wrap my mind around that might be sustainable for her well, similar to like the leper colony where you're just, like, you're just unclean. You got to go live somewhere by yourself. But even the lepers, it was a leper colony. There are other lepers around. So this was a sad, sad state for her, right? So she had probably lost so much, right? And she was just continually to hide her condition. And that's heartbreaking because you think about all of the relationships that must have cost her, right? What her life must have looked like. You know, I'm sure she figured if people figured this out, everyone would leave. No one would stay. Like, being in a relationship with me is not enough for, it. Like, like, who would sign up for that knowing that they would be unclean? And she kept all the undesirable stuff in the secret, hidden from everybody. And when I look at that and I think, that, man, that's really, really sad, right? I have to... I have to be honest and I say, we are really, really good at being fake too. Because we only show people what we think is acceptable for people to see. And we don't share everything, right? We end to, to walk around, like we all walk around like we're not unclean. We all walk around like we got it all together, right? We clean up well and I guarantee you we show up here on Sunday and even standing in front of you guys, I got issues, you guys got issues, we all got issues, but you know what? We make it in a way where no one will ever be able to tell. No one can see them. Um, and we're way too insecure to tell anyone about our struggles or our issues because we're scared of the way that people will look at us. Same exact thing as this lady, right? This lady feared rejection. Every single one of us fears rejection as well, right? And I think a lot of us can relate to this woman, right? The loneliness she must have felt, how she felt about herself, you know, the way that she, she viewed her condition, you know, I feel a lot of the times when we get stuck in our own head, right, when we're looking in the mirror and we really know what we really see, even if it's hidden from the people around us, right, and we just feel really, really alone. And I guarantee you, just like this lady, we probably believe the same lie, that if the people around me, like my close friends, my intimate circle, 
right? If they knew the stuff that I wrestled with, if they knew the stuff that I'm struggling with, they wouldn't love me either. And they would reject me. You know, and it's fun, in, in the Gospel of, of uh, St. Mark, there's this, there's this line written, and it's, it sticks out so strong. And it says, and she had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. And that, that verse, is, it's a heartbreaking verse. Like she tried, she tried hard. She tried a lot of different things, right? And I think there's a lot of us where we, you know, when something's missing or when something's wrong, we'll search out for solutions, right? And for me, when I look at this, for many physicians, like that's man-made solutions, right? Like if, if I'm gonna chase something, I think this is gonna make it better, this is what's gonna make me whole, this is this, this is that, and we chase and we chase and we chase and we chase, but does it ever make it better? Never makes it better. And I think a lot of the times, like we're so far down a road that it's hard to, to, to pull back from that, right? And we're so far down a road, and really we're no better, but we're actually much, much worse. And you hear the pain in the verse, right? And there's so much in that verse that's left unsaid, right? She, she spent all that she had, but she was made no better, but rather grew worse. So I'm going to ask you, in what aspects of your life have you tried to make yourself feel better? Like, what have you chased trying to feel better, right? Because I feel like we attempt to do all of these things to heal ourselves, to comfort ourselves, to make ourselves feel better. But just like this woman, we end up in the same exact thing. It costs us a lot. Like going down, it costs us a lot to try to make ourselves feel better. But in the end, we were just worse. And ultimately, we suffer at the hand of those who think that they can make things better. The more we chase, the worse we get. You know, the, the biblical example that comes straight to mind about this is the prodigal son, right? The prodigal son was off on a mission, and he was, he was going to go do his own thing, right? And he, and he chased, and he chased, and he chased, and he chased, right? And he spent, and he spent, and he spent, and he spent. And he indulged, and he indulged, and he indulged, and he indulged. Until what? Until he found himself in the most detestable situation. And he just basically said, this isn't working. Like, this isn't working. I need to get up and I need to go back to my father's house. Right? So this woman, the woman with the issue of blood, she hears that Christ is in town. Right? So she's been suffering for 12 years. She hears that Christ is in town. And there's something about Christ, right? Because Christ had a reputation. It was by no mistake that there was a multitude that was just following him around, that was like pressing into him. Everybody knew that there was something special about Christ. There was something that they've never heard, like it, it, the generation had never seen it. And to be honest with you, 400 years have never seen it, right? Because the nation of Israel had grown, it had been 400 years, with the exception of John the Baptist, that they even had a prophet, right? But, some, but they knew, Christ's reputation was, this prophet, he had a heart for the people. He wasn't a, a judging, condemning person like the scribes and the Pharisees that were quick to point out everything that you did wrong and rub your nose in it. Right? No, he was loving, he was kind, and the most beautiful part of it is his reputation was that he had compassion on the sick. Right? His reputation was he heals, that, that he changes people's lives. And that was his way, in Matthew 8, 16, it says, When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word, and he healed all who were sick. Right? In Matthew 9, 16, a chapter later, and it says, And Jesus went about all of the cities and all of the villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. In Matthew 15, 30, it says, And a great multitude came to him, having with them the lame, blind, mute, maimed, and many others. And they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. So you can imagine when, when this woman heard that Christ was in her town, you know that she got excited. You know, there was a part of her that says, you know what, maybe this is different. Like the religious leaders, they'll, they'll quick to point out everything that I do wrong. They'll quick to point out that I'm sick. They're quick to point out that I'm, that I'm unclean. They're quick to tell people that they better stay away from me, right? Because that's what they were bringing to the table. But they said, no, 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 but, but, but Christ, this man heals. This man's compassionate. This man is loving. This man doesn't kick you down, he lifts you up. And guys, let's not make a mistake about it. That is the God that we serve. Our, the God that we serve is to lift us up, not to rub our nose in it, 
right? So there was something about it. And you can imagine when this lady, when, when she heard that he was coming, she did two things, right? She got up and she got ready. That was it because it wasn't just enough for Christ to be in her midst, right? She knew that there was, it was on her. Like, I need to do stuff. I'm not, she didn't sit at home and pray, God, I, you know, I heard that you're compassionate. I heard that you heal. Can you come to me? Right? Can you make this happen? I'm just going to hang out here. And God, if it's your will, you'll come. No, she took initiative and she did it. And keep in mind, she had been bleeding for 12 years. 12 years. So if nothing else, I guarantee you she was low on iron. Okay? But if you ask anyone medically, what do you think her condition was? It was not good. Right? I guarantee you she was probably weak. She was probably frail. But the problem is, is that didn't stop her. Her current condition didn't stop her because she knew of her need, right? And she was ready for healing. She had hope. She had faith. And that's the stuff that helped her persevere through her situation, right? So my question is for us is, are we ready for healing? Because God is willing, right? He's willing to heal us spiritually. But the question is, is are we willing to pursue him for it? Are we willing to approach him for it? Right? The, the other thing is this lady, do you think that she was ready for healing? Or do you think that she expected healing? I think she expected healing. She wouldn't have done what she would, like did if she did not have an expectation, right? A belief that Christ was going to do big things for her, right? And my question is, is like, we show up a lot, right? Like, I, I feel like I look at you guys every Sunday, like, we show up a lot. But my question is, is do we show up or do we come with an expectation? Right? I pray that we all show up with an expectation that God's going to show up today. God's going to do a big thing today. Right? God's going to change me today. Because that's, that's, what, that's, what, that's how we need to show up. Right? We need to show up like we're ready for healing. Right? So my question is, is there any part of us that show up expecting God meet me here? I don't want this to be a meeting. I don't want Peter to talk for 20 minutes and for me just to go home. Right? Like, Show up. Give me a message. Show me what you want me to do and I will do it. Because that's, that's how we need to do, right? Because we have to believe that God can show up wherever we are, whenever we are, but we cannot show up just to come and go. Because that's, that's an utter miss. So do you want things to be different? See, because for the woman with issue of blood, do you know what was draining her strength? It was her issue of blood, right? It's the fact that her body was bleeding for 12 years straight, and that was robbing her strength. But we might not have issues of blood, but I guarantee you, every single one of us in here, something is robbing our strength. There is something in our life that is taking our strength from us, right? And it's something that we are probably trying to medicate. It's probably something that we're probably trying to, like, you know, like, just let me just address it somehow, but, but there's something that's robbing us from our strength. You know, the question is, is how long until you face it? How long until you realize that this can't be here anymore? Like this area of my life, it's, it's robbing my strength and, and I need healing in this area of my life. You know, it's great. I have this coworker, right? And the guy, literally probably one of the most unhealthiest people I've ever met, right? He's, 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 he's old in age, right? And every day, like not every day, but when, when he's going to lunch, he says, hey, Peter, you know, I'm going in and out. You want lunch? And I'm like, good Lord. You're going to have a heart attack by like, like at your desk, right? And then he's like, or I'm going to Tommy Burgers or I'm going to go get some Del Taco. And I was like, bro, like, can you, can you, you're a good employee. Can you just try to live a little bit longer? And, um, and I say, how's your cholesterol? You know, like, how's your blood pressure? Like, what's going on? Like, and then he says, oh, I don't know. I don't go to a doctor. I don't, I don't like to think about that stuff. Blatantly turns a blind eye to him, right? Blatantly turns a blind eye to him. Refuses to get it. He's in denial. Right? But let me ask you, the fact that he's not checking his cholesterol or his blood pressure, does that change his cholesterol or his blood pressure? No. No. See, because it is what it is, and eventually he's going to have to face that. Right? And it's gonna, he's going to face it when it blows up right in his face. So my question is, is how bad are you going to let it get? Like in your own life, how bad are you going to let it get? Right? So she told herself, I just need to touch the border of her, her garment. And I think a lot of the times we tell this story... And we think, oh, my God, dude, that's such great faith. She didn't even want to touch him, right? She knew it was just the border of the garment that was going to be enough, right? Do you think it was great faith? I don't think it was great faith. You want to think it was? I think she was terrified. 
She was terrified that she might accidentally touch him because she was unclean and she was forbidden to touch anyone else, let alone a prophet of God. So she was terrified, right? Because her case required extreme faith and extreme accuracy. So again, the fact that we show up here every Sunday again and again and again, I'm going to ask you, do you show up with the intention of touching him? To know that's going to take effort for us to actually get there and actually touch him? See, because the good news is, is we know the personality of our God, which is perfect. When we look at like the parables that we were reading, when we were looking at the encounters that he had with people, the fact that his, his heart is always for the broken, the lowly, the sinner, that, that's who he's drawn towards, right? So us, we don't need to worry about the hem of the garment. For us, we can just, we can just throw ourselves at him, right? We don't have to worry about that because we know that he welcomes us. We know that we will be healed. And, and if you tell me, you know, I'm going to point out this woman, right? Because if you feel that you can't, okay, if you feel that you can't do this, and it's too hard. I'm going to point out this woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years, right? And keep in mind, where was, where was Christ going? Christ was going on the way to go perform another miracle, right? So Jairus, who is probably hustling to get Christ to his daughter's house for healing, she puts a pause button on that. Imagine if nothing else. Think about how challenging that is, right? Think about how challenging it is for this woman who's been bleeding for 12 years straight, who's probably not in the best physical health with all of her strength, right? And they've got this multitude going towards Jairus' house, and she's this weak little woman bleeding for 12 years, and she's pushing through that crowd trying to get to Christ, right? And I'm going to tell you, what I learned from this woman here is great faith, great accuracy will get you an encounter with the Savior. And that's exactly what she, she came across, right? Because how many people were there? I don't know exactly how many people, but I'll tell you it was a multitude. So it was a big amount of people, right? So there's a bunch of people there, but how many people had a true encounter? One. Just her. Just her, right? Think about how packed this church gets every single Sunday, right? We can even say that there are a multitude of people here that show up here weekly, right? But my question is, is are we going to be one of the multitude, or are we going to be the one who has an encounter. And what's our expectation even? Do we come for an encounter or are we completely pleased and is it enough just to be one of the multitude? Because will we push past all of that stuff? Will we push past all of the people? Because I'll be the first one to tell you that the people, they can be a distraction from Christ. The people that surround us, I'll tell you, they'll, they might even be an obstacle, right? But we have to worship the same Christ that was in this story, that rewarded her effort, right? And not only did he reward her effort, but she was willing, he was willing and is still willing to heal all. So she touched him and was immediately made well, right? It says that right then and there, she knew, right? But something happened, right? Because Christ stopped everything. He stopped everything that he was doing and he asked, who touched me? Right? And at this point, I just want to make something very clear. At this point, we'd be like, well, the miracle is done. No, the miracle is not done. Half of the miracle is done. Right? Because she stopped bleeding. That was half of the miracle. Okay? But let me ask you guys something. Did Christ know who touched him? Honestly, I don't think anyone will question the fact that Christ knew exactly who touched him. Right? Of course he did. Like, it's just, it blows my mind, right? And I'll be honest with you, I have this little mental picture that like when I think about this story, I feel like Christ is pushing through the multitude, right? And he knows exactly where this lady is. And he's kind of slowing down a little bit, right? Kind of positioning himself in a way, giving her an opportunity to get to him. He knew exactly who touched him. His desire was for her to touch him, right? And, that, and what happened is, you see, because Christ healed her. But that was just the physical part. He physically healed her. But what Christ really wanted to do is he really wanted to draw her into relationship with him. Right? He didn't want to just be her healer. He wanted to be her savior, which are completely different things. Okay? For, for Christ, the purpose is not to stop blood. 
right? And I think it's funny because so many times when we pray and we pray and we pray when we need things, like that is our, that is our goal, right? And Christ, you know, for him, it's not just about answering the prayer, right? Like he'll answer the prayer. He'll do huge things for us. He'll bless us. He'll even, you know, stop things from happening, um, you know. But all of this for Christ, this is just a means to an end. Because for Christ, all of that stuff plays into our relationship with him, right? So he stopped the blood. But that's not what Christ wanted to do. What he wanted to do is he wanted to develop the relationship with her, right? Because remember, she was considered unclean, right? Even after the blood dried up. So at that very, very moment, was she clean? No. She needed to wait seven more days to be considered clean, right? And all of this was hidden from the crowd for good reason, right? Because this girl was just a defiling mess, you know, just going through this whole multitude. Everybody she touched defiled, 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 right? If that crowd would have known what this woman was doing to her, they would have flipped out. And they probably would have cast her out, right? But then, and this is a beautiful thing, right? And I'll tell you, and I was telling Claudia earlier, my, my, I titled this thing, My Shame for His Glory. Because I want you to think about what happened here, right? My Shame for His Glory. So the, the beautiful thing here, right, is when Christ asked who touched me, she spilled the beans, right? She, she, she said it all. She said, I've had this issue of blood for 12 years. You know, this has happened, that happened. I went to doctors. I spent all this and this and this and this and this. And she just spilled all the beans. Was that a dangerous thing for her to do? 100%. I can imagine the people in the multitude were kind of like, wait, wait, hold on. Did, did, did you touch me? Like, do I got to go? Like, I got to go quarantine, right? Like, it was a very, very dangerous thing to do, right? But what, but what Christ did is he took her shame and turned it into his glory right? Her shame turned it into his glory. And that's the question that I feel that all of us are asked, right? Like we're all so private. We're all so, we're great at hiding things, right? But the question is, is will you allow Christ to use your shame for his glory? Because that's how he shows up. Even St. Paul, St. Paul says, hey, if it's my weaknesses, if it's my weaknesses where you show up and where you're glorified, then I'll talk about my weaknesses all day long. And I feel that that's one aspect that the church has not gotten on, on board with. Right? We don't do that well, but we should do it well. Right? Are we willing to air out those areas of our life that we keep secret so Christ can show up and can heal? See, like I said, only half the miracle is done. right? Because he heals her, but now he's drawing her into relationship with him. Right? In Mark 5.34, and I love this, because what did we say? What was her pr prior condition? Was she lonely? 100%. Shallow relationships, 100%. Right? No one knew who she really was. And in, in Mark 5, 34, he says, and he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace um, and be healed of your affliction. And here we have a woman who's terrified to even come and touch him. Right? To come and touch the prophet in case that he would realize that she defiled him. You know, guys, you guys should just wrap your mind around this, right? Like, she's terrified. Like, what if he gets upset that I touched him, right? But it, in reality, what's his response? His response is not upset, but he basically looks at her and he calls her daughter. One of the most intimate relationships, right? So she's, she's fearful and he couldn't be any more loving, right? And that blows my mind that our God, who should be repulsed by our sin, who should who's all holy, should be totally over everything that we do and the way that we keep turning our back on him and the way we keep choosing sin, right? And we don't have to worry about a God who's disgusted from that because he will look at us still with love, compassion, and care, right? Because remember, loneliness was her biggest symptom, and Christ gave her everything that she needed. And I believe that when we come to Christ and we take him our needs, he will meet our needs. He will meet them completely, our deepest needs. But Christ's healings, are a means to an end. They are not the end. And that's what we saw here, that he heals her to bring her into a deeper relationship, right? And the true miracle that we see throughout the Bible from cover to cover, right, is that we should make him unclean the same way that this woman should have made Christ unclean when she defiled him, when she touched him, right? That you and I are the same exact thing that his holiness should hate and be repulsed by. And that's, why it only makes sense for him to find us disgusting. 
But the real miracle in all of it is that he desires us, that he's not repulsed from us, that he's not disgusted by us, but he calls us into relationship with him, you know, and that we are the only thing that he wants. Instead, the miracle is the holy desires the filthy. So my question is, is would you accept that? You know, are you willing to trade shame for glory, our shame for his glory, right? Are we allowed, are we allowing ourselves to step up into lightness and to share some of these things that are dark so that he can, that he can heal them? No more secrets, no more darkness. Because God is willing, but we need to step out of the hiding and we need to follow this woman's example. Do some hard things. Do them with intentionality and, and touch him and really, really know him. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Stand up and pray. In the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, name one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord, because this is such a beautiful story, Lord. It's such a beautiful story about how the way that we look at you, Lord, and how we're terrified, Lord. And we know our current state and we hide it. We hide it thinking that we can deceive all of the people around us, Lord, feeling that we can, you know, we can present well. But really, in reality, we have no power. We have no strength, Lord. Our quality of life is poor. And we think that, you know, we settle for that a lot of the times, Lord, because we're terrified, Lord. But, and we're terrified to approach you. We're, we're, we're terrified to be vulnerable with you, Lord. We're terrified to be vulnerable with the people around us, Lord. But a story like this just reminds us how your heart is for us, Lord, and that you want to make us whole, Lord, and you don't judge us. If we come with a repentant heart, Lord, if we come, Lord, and we just lay our needs down before you, Lord, and, and we come with extreme faith and extreme accuracy, Lord, that you will never reject, Lord, that you will always take us in. You will heal us, Lord. You will draw us into a relationship with you, and we know that that relationship, Lord, that relationship will, it will meet all of our needs and more. So, Lord, I ask that in this coming week, Lord, that you give us the, the perspective that we need, Lord, the guidance that we need, Lord, to, just to draw closer to you, Lord, to touch you, not just, the, not just the garment, Lord, not just the hem of the garment, Lord, but that we touch you because we know that you will not be repulsed by us and that we may receive power too. And I ask that this might be ongoing, Lord, again and again and again. I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord, that you bless this meeting, Lord, that... Uh, that you hear these prayers lifted to the confession of all these things from our tears. Here's we pray one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.